Good afternoon. This is Terry Pauling with People's Company, and welcome to the People's Company Summer Landowner Webinar Series. Uh, for those of you who are um, watching this uh, via the computer in internet access, why right now we have the schedule in front of you and. Today's discussion is going to be on farm lease termination and considerations for next year. Next week, Thursday, our review and will be on farm land market. And then we'll finish up our webinar series with a farm bill update. Um, not sure exactly what we're going to have on that since um, Congress right now has not done anything with farm bill, but we'll uh, try and give you some scenarios that may look out into the future. So. With that, I think we're getting close. Um, it's about I've got 5:29 right now. We may wait just another minute or so to see if we have some other people come on on board. For those of you who have been on um, previous webinars, thanks for returning. And for those of you who are new to our series, uh, we appreciate your your attendance today. All the phones are going to be muted. Um, today so that we can uh, better have a better quality of audio. If you have any questions during the presentation in the upper left, upper right corner of your screen, there's a place that you can actually type your questions in and we will get to them later on in the presentation. Toward the end of the presentation we will uh, unmute all the phones so you will have an opportunity if you're just on uh, your cell phone or mobile phone right now might be able to, to ask a voice question. So with that, um, if I don't hear any objections from the powers of B, uh, we should be about ready to go. Um, the, another object for those of you who are attending uh, and for those who were unable to attend, if you know who they are, uh, we will have the the uh, webinars on, uh, on our um, YouTube YouTube uh, page, you can go to our People's Company website, you click on the YouTube icon in the upper right corner, search the list of, of webinars um, and pick the one you want to review and then watch it. The presentation will be there as well. So this webinar will be available probably around midweek next week. Um, so you'll be able to do that. Um, let's see here. Today's speakers, um, we have Brian Feldposh, who is one of our two farm management specialists. Brian manages several farms uh, for landowners uh, who have chosen not to take on the risk of farm management. Our other speaker today is Daryl Mills. Daryl has an extensive farm and conservation experience and provides expertise to our farm management specialists when it, when it comes to development of conservation plans for those managed farms. And with that said, I'm going to turn it over to Brian to get today's presentation started. And I think we're going to start off with these terminations. Uh, Brian, are you there? Yeah. Thanks, Terry. Uh, this afternoon, uh, we're going to take a little time and, and talk about uh, what we're looking at uh, as we head into 2014 and start the leasing year. Uh, it's a timely topic right now, as uh, most of you are aware of. And if you're not, uh, take note of it. Uh, September 1st in the state of Iowa is the deadline uh, to uh, serve notice to your tenant um, to terminate them um, on the current lease. If that's not done by September 1st, the current lease rolls over automatically into the following year. And the technical language is termination. And in, and in most cases, uh, what you're really doing is just serving notice uh, to the landowner or to the tenant farmer that uh, you're going to make modifications to the lease. You the Two elements uh, to point out, I guess, and that's kind of why we want to lead with this, is because it's so timely and, and it's a short time span. Is um, the notices um, of changes have to be done in either uh, via registered mail or in person um, in getting a signature uh, to verify that obviously that uh, this notice has been served in a timely manner. And the second part of that is, is a lot of times uh, landowners. Um, also get confused 
September 1st is not the date that you must have a new rental agreement in place for next year. Uh, it's just the date that you have to serve notice um, that you're going to make changes. And uh, uh, forms are available. Uh, we can help uh, coordinate getting you a form for that, or they're also available for Iowa State Extension um, as well. And um, today we're going to concentrate on basically three elements when it comes to farm lease renewals and, and considerations for next year. And those three things are, are basically the structure of the elements uh, when we look at farm leases. Number one is the value. And it's typically the only element that ever gets discussed or, or gets questioned very much in a farm lease, and that's of course what the uh, land lease price will be for the upcoming year. The second element um, is the lease structure. There's all kinds of options in structuring not only when the um, rent is received, but uh, in what form is the rental agreement designed. Is it a straight cash lease or is there some kind of a flexible measure of it? Or looking at the rate of returns and the commodity prices to be aggressive, uh, do you want to take the risk and get involved in a share uh, agreement or maybe custom farming? Uh, so that's part of what we're going to discuss today. And then the lease terms. Uh, one of the things we hear often is, is um, we want to collect information or we're trying to gather information or asking questions or how do we protect um, ourselves, um, landowner rights. And so what are the different terms that uh, are in leases or what can be in leases that uh, help uh, give landowners uh, access to more data from their um, tenants and what else can be put in leases that you know serve as some protections you know this spring we had this discussion uh, quite a bit in the legislature about um, landowner liability and, and it does, doesn't necessarily cover all of that but there are other elements involved in leasing that can help um, protect landowners and their rights in their land so talking about land values uh, this year um, to start out the discussion just a little bit, um, you know, one of the things that have happened over the past uh, three, four years with the commodity prices just on a constant escalation mode um, and pretty good yields even with our uh, drought year is there's almost been an automatic um, rental rate increase year over year. Um, typically when you start the conversation, I think our land uh, owners and our tenants um, the tenants already realize that there's going to be an increase more than likely on most farms. Um, along with uh, commodity prices, land values have risen um, along with those. And uh, going into this year, we've seen the land values kind of stabilize, if not maybe drop off just a tad, but mainly stabilize. And then uh, we've also seen gross revenues, the projections going into 2014, um, we're looking at you know a lot more four dollar corn, eleven dollar soybeans in the scenario versus seven eight dollar corn and fourteen fifteen dollar. So does that actually mean that there won't be an increase? Not necessarily, but it's on a case by case, farm by farm um, situation. Second point to talk about is there there is no average farms um, right now. We've got a lot of great surveys out there, a lot of great um, information that's been captured by different organizations and. Uh, colleges and it's all good information. Uh, the thing about surveys is is they're only capturing information from a small sampling of farms in an, any given county or any given area and then it's all put together and it comes out as an average. A lot of times average by um, the CSR or corn suitability rating that productivity index we have and there are no average farms and even trying to compare it to um, CSRs, um, farms lie differently, they, they drain differently, and so there isn't necessarily any way to capture a, a fair market on any one farm based on a survey. Um, the third thing and the third point is, is we often hear, and I hear conversations start with, well, I heard this somewhere, and just as a kind of a humorous point and move on, is their coffee shop isn't the pulse of, of rental values in any community. Um, you know, there you're going to hear the extremes, the extremes highs and the extreme lows one way or another. As we look at what a, a good value or a good lease rate would be, one of the things we take into consideration often is the ownership's goals and risk tolerances. And every farm owner, when we sit down with them, has different goals, long-term, short-term goals, um, and they also have different um, levels of risk. 
you know, in any investment, one of the first things someone will ask um, when you're dealing with them is, you know, are you a are you a risk taker or are you a risk avoider? And we do the same thing basically when we look at farm leases. We take a whole farm asset management approach to it. Um, we look at it as we've got a two-part um, investment here. We've got the annual dividend coming back and the return on investment with our cash leases every year. But moreover, uh, when we look at our farm management program, we also look at the long-term benefits of, of our uh, of farming and land ownership and what things we could do um, in the long run to improve or enhance the value of that land. One of the things is our conservation and uh, natural lands programs, which not only um, do offer benefits to the farm and conservation and long-term appreciation, but they can also um, provide some opportunities for revenue generation as well. And uh, at this time, I think I'll have Daryl Mills talk about our natural lands program. Okay, that's great, Brian. Um, <clears throat> yeah, we added this uh, natural lands program to the existing farm management work that's been done by Randy and Brian over the last 20 years. Uh, we added about a year or so ago. And um, again, to repeat what Brian said, it's a whole farm management approach. Um, the farms that are all tillable from ditch to ditch, um, you know, probably not so much opportunity there. Uh, however, we have farms with uh, pasture land, um, riparian areas, and uh, woodlands that um, deserve attention as well. Um, so in addition to looking at what the, um, the return on the tillable acres might be, uh, we look at increasing the health of the land um, in pastures or CRP buffers. Uh, could be a patch burn grazing system or rotational grazing system. Um, the Invasive species are a big issue on pasture lands um, with multiple or rows or uh, eastern red cedar. Um, uh, in southern Iowa, it's hedge trees and, and locust or dogwood. Um, so those are things that we look at as, as uh, how farms change over time and the pushback that's required to maintain the health of the property. Um, in the woodlands, you know, of course, we can look at um, uh, revenue from logging in the long term, um, timber stand improvement for wildlife habitat. Um, there's other benefits of, of just man managing woodlands um, uh, other than uh, other than just ignoring them. Um, so again, reducing the non-native species, the ironwood in there in the woodlands. Um, prescribed fire is a tool we've used both on pasture land and um, on CRP buffers and uh, sometimes occasionally in woodlands as well. So the basic goal is reclaim the, the health of the land in the long run and, um, and the rationale for looking at these non-tillable acres is there's increased public pressure on ag producers um, for good stewardship practices and, um, and, 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 a, and a kind of a cry for additional conservation. Um, with the government uh, indecision on farm policy or a farm bill right now, uh, we're seeing a reduction or a pullback in, in some of the programs that are available. But I think in the long run, um, in spite of this um, volatility, if you will, uh, surrounding uh, conservation programs, uh, it's still a good time to invest in, uh, in the land uh, given these strong commodity prices. Um, uh, the water quality issues, um, uh, we believe, should go beyond buffers and terraces and tile and, um, and look at um, what some of these uh, non-total acres can do to increase water quality. Um, there are programs available uh, for um, native grass establishment or tree establishment along riparian areas. Um, so again, it's, a, it's kind of, we're interested in, in uh, forwarding a notion of a whole farm stewardship approach and um, this is consistent with um, what Peoples has done in the past, uh, farm management uh, for both the tillable and the non-tillable acres. Uh, we don't see these non-tillable acres as marginal lands or um, wastelands or remainders, um, terms that we're familiar uh, with, but um, we see them as uh, every acre counts and, um, 
and in the long run, you know, it, they're part of the investment that, that landowners have made in owning property um, that deserve uh, some attention as well. So um, that's about it from here. Um, I'll turn it back over to Brian. Thanks, Daryl. So that's a little bit of, about the long-term strategy and as we look at whole farm management it's it's not only the tillable acres but it's also some of those other acres that that can add value if not uh, through cash uh, income but perhaps through long-term uh, improvements which will benefit the land and, and the environment in the long run so getting back now more directly to our year-to-year -year income our annual income on our farm leases um, some of the things we look at when we sit down and talk with owners about uh, their goals and risk tolerance uh, is their, what they expect the return on their investment to be. In Iowa over the, last, uh, over the last 50 years, or some will say that if you look back far enough, it's over 100 years, the average return on investment on Iowa farmland has ranged between 3 and 5% each year. Um, so that's one of the baselines we take a look at. Next uh, area we can take a look at is what's a fair share of the gross revenue produced. Um, gross revenue that we're looking at is the commodity yield um, times the commodity price available in the local market area. So we take a look at what the gross revenue is and, and you try to determine um, based on some comparisons what the uh, fair return for not only the landowner but also the producer would be uh, in any given situation. And then along with that, when we're looking at structuring our leases, is we want the revenue um, for the landowner to, re to re reflect the risk that they have um, extended in, in the lease, as, as well as uh, take a look at how that is equitable with the uh, farm operator as well. In order to do that, one of the things uh, People's Company um, has developed about five, six years ago was what we call the Farm Lease Analyzer. And the reason we developed this um, analyzing system is because we, going back to one of our first points, we know that there are no average farms in the state of Iowa. You can find a well-drained, well-maintained farm with a lower CSR in the 70s or 60s, and uh, it will produce like one of the top producing farms in north central Iowa in the 80s and 90s. Um, conversely, if you've got a 90 CSR farm that has drainage issues that's poorly uh, managed that maybe needs some tile put into it, um, it won't produce the crop that it has the potential to. So we have to look at things on a case-by-case -case basis and then make decisions on rent and ownership investments um, on that case-by-case -case basis. So what we do when we start our farm lease analyzing system is we look at ownership costs. What does the owner have as year-to-year -year expenses, real estate taxes, uh, liability insurance, uh, management costs, um, and then we also try to gather as much information as we can, specific farm information, yield maps uh, showing yields in specific areas of the farm for both corn, soybeans, and other crops, uh, and the APH, their annual production history that's uh, maintained for crop insurance purposes. Uh, those things are, are elements that help, help us identify what kind of a producing um, farm it is. We also take a look at input costs. Uh, what does it cost to grow a crop? So we look at local seed. Uh, fertilizer and pesticide costs, and then on the revenue side, we try to look back and um, take a look at um, the nearest elevator or processor. So on our farm lease analyzer uh, program, this is the cover sheet that we use when we go ahead and, and uh, begin the analyzation uh, process. Here's we have all the input data, uh, the landowner's name, the, the date that we do it. We also take a look at the income projections, corn, soybeans, how many acres, uh, what the five-year average yields have been, and what the price per unit measured is as well. Um, we, then we take a look at low, landowner operating costs and put those in for our specific farm, and we take a look at crop input um, expenses and plug all of them in for our specific farm in this case. Uh, so we get very get down to a very specific um, 
element uh, of our farm uh, so we can look and see down to every acre or down to the farm acre um, how that farm, how we expect it to produce in a very specific manner. Um, our farm lease analyzer is broken up into basically four categories. Um, and what we look at is the risk tolerance involved with each one of them and where our owner owners um, fit in our lease spectrum. And this is our lease uh, analyzer pyramid and we take a look at the risk and reward um, basis and we've broken it up into four categories. Um, at the very bottom of the pyramid where there's the least amount of risk where things are the most stable is cash rent. Um, and we know from year to year a, a dedicated cash rent that stays the same um, co continuously is, is the most stable uh, um, source of income and the safest, but it also um, doesn't give any opportunity like we've had the last few years to have any additional reward when uh, commodity prices or yields uh, escalate. Uh, and I think as we all know, um, the word volatility, volatility in the commodity markets, volatility in the weather, and volatility in, in crop production yields uh, are going to be pretty key. Um, so cash rent doesn't give an owner necessarily the opportunity to cash in on any of that volatility. Uh, the next uh, level of risk that we take a look at um, is our flexible crop um, cash lease option. And uh, we'll talk about that just a little more um, because it, in a second because it combines both the cash lease elements and the crop share or custom farming elements. And then up at the top we've, uh, we've got uh, uh, a 75-25 crop share where the owner um, decides that they're going to go ahead and produce a crop and instead of just paying uh, a farm operator a flat fee to, to do all the um, land uh, preparation and crop uh, production practices for the year, they offer that uh, farm operator a 25% share of the crop. 75% share of, of the crop um, is maintained by the owner. Um, and that's a lot riskier as it gets to the top of the pyramid, uh, but in the same case, it has that opportunity to take advantage of, of those swings and volatility in the market. And then at the very top of the risk pyramid with also the greatest reward uh, opportunity for upside or possibly downside in the market is custom farming or, um, or retained ownership. And custom farming is, just as we mentioned a second ago, is just basically hiring a farm operator, come in and do the production um, practices, uh, plant the crop, harvest the crop, um, the spray for weeds um, and other pests during the year. Uh, but all the risk and all the marketing is on, on that farm operator. So that's the riskiest of all of them, but it also has the best opportunity to capitalize on those swings in the market um, and the greatest chance for rewards. But what I want to talk about is that one in the middle that we kind of went over quickly. Um, it's an opportunity that we see in the market that kind of provides the best of both worlds for um, the landowner and it also provides maybe a little bit of downside and upside protection for, um, or mainly downside protection for uh, farm operators. Uh, the flexible cash lease. And in our flexible cash lease, there's three negotiation points. Number one is a base cash rent guarantee. And that guarantee basically lets a farm owner or farm owners know that they definitely will receive a base rent no matter what happens to that crop during the year. Um, if we have a really dry year or prices really go go low, you have a guaranteed base rent, and that's typically real close to to the market value, market rent uh, going on in the uh, in the local area, and what we would say is fair for that farm. Um, the second point is the trigger revenue, and the trigger revenue is what the expected yield um, and price is based on uh, something comparable to that guarantee. So we take the expected yield from that APH data, that yield monitor data that we've gathered, um, and take a look at prices in the local area and come up with a trigger revenue that, that uh, matches up well with what we've established our base cash rent at. So that's the second point. And then the third point is the share percentage, and this is what the owner receives. It's the owner's bonus payment um, above the trigger level. Um, so there's three negotiations points. There's the base cash rent, um, the trigger revenue, and the share percentage. And to try to put that in a uh, picture for you of what it looks like, um, here we have the flexible 
here we have the flexible cash lease, the, and here's what it looks like. The farm has a base rent of $275 per acre. The trigger revenue uh, is $800 per acre, and the 30 and it has a 35% share bonus. So uh, we've got our three we've got our three uh, key elements that we talked about there. There's our base revenue that we're guaranteed. This is our trigger revenue of $800 per acre, and then our 35% bonus share. So what does all this mean? Well, it's pretty simple actually. Um, let's say the corn yielded 200 bushels per acre and the average price at the local ethanol plant was $4.75. Uh, in this case, the annual gross income was $950 for that particular year. So in our flexible cash lease, um, at the end of the year in December, when we get the actual yield data in and we've got our average prices for the year for that local co-op, uh, we came up with $950 in actual revenue. Well, in our lease, we had an $800 trigger price for gross revenue, so we exceeded that by $150. So there's $150 of shared income. Our owner's share is 35%. That was the third point we negotiated in our, in our lease. So one-third of that $150 is $50. That's a $50 bonus payment um, that the owner receives in the month of uh, December at the end of the year after everything we know. So we had a base rent of 275 but with our bonus we were able to bring that up another $50 to $325 in that particular year. And that's kind of uh, one of the nice things we like about um, that flex lease. Um, if the revenue wasn't as high, if the land, if the farm wasn't producing um, at, a, at a level where um, a bonus payment was warranted and there there isn't one and that kind of creates this equitable situation um, with our tenants. So our lease analyzer gives us that information and helps us design a, a flex lease. It also, here's our lease strategies, here's our cash lease, our flex lease, here's our crop share lease, and here's our retained ownership. And when we do our lease analyzer for a farm, we can compare the returns down here for the owners landowners and gross profit, 274, 285, all the way to 340. And at the same time, we can take a look down here at what it looks like our gross profit is before uh, machinery uh, costs and labor costs for farmers um, of what they're making. And we can take a look at, at those elements and kind of arrive at what we think is an equitable um, lease uh, as far as establishing a value from year to year. So that's a little bit of perspective on, on some of the options available on lease values, um, from the cash lease to the flexible cash lease to the crop share leases um, to the retained ownership options. Um, the next part uh, that I want to discuss is some of the terms involved in the leases. Um, and when we look at the leases, some of the things, uh, the terms that we have involved in our leases are, are some specific language um, dealing with documentation. Um, one area is, is operator insurance. We want to make sure all of our operators have liability insurance to protect um, not only themselves but landowners in the event of an accident as well as making sure all subcontractors have those. Uh, we also ask for crop production strategies, what, what it looks like they're going to plant from year to year and what their typical rotation is. Uh, yield data collection. We want to make sure that we get the yield data. Um, we require some reporting in our leases and uh, we follow that along to make sure we receive that information because in the end that documentation um, not only obviously is needed for the flex leases but for all leases it also um, increases the value of the farm in the long run um, with knowing what the actual production is if it's a lower CSR farm that's producing above or yield data can also be used in the event that tile is needed or some other um, system is needed to improve um, uh, production on a farm. We also require fertility reporting and management, um, phosphorus, potassium, um, pH, we make sure the lime is, is properly applied. Um, we require soil testing um, on a uh, regular basis. And so when we collect all this information, we've got our soil tests, we've got our yields, we've got our pH, we've got our um, phosphorus, we've got our potassium samples and all that, all of a sudden we've got this huge basis of information about each and every farm that we maintain. And that basis, like everything we, we know and have learned about, is you know data becomes more important all the time. 
We also use this uh, information for environmental practices, as Daryl was talking about. Um, gather that data. It helps with erosion control or maybe drainage situations, as I alluded to earlier with um, tiling. Uh, the possibility of being able to add tile in the long run, and then also uh, records for pesticide applications, mapping and records, uh, to make sure that we have that information all in place. And then along with that, um, with our lease terms and our lease uh, structure, we've talked about some more lease terms um, that we look at that I think are, are really good um, are some landowner protections. Um, how do we protect that asset? on top of guaranteeing that return from year to year. Um, one of the things is uh, terms in, in the lease regarding recreational rights and retention, who gets to hunt the land, um, who doesn't, um, who has permission, um, how is it maintained. Um, development clauses, some of the land closer to more metro areas or um, other areas that may have some development potential like along interstates. Um, we it include a development clause, which basically means that in the event that a purchaser needs or wishes to uh, go ahead and start developing the land before the lease terminates, before the uh, farm is harvested, um, that clause is in there to um, allow that to happen so it's a more marketable piece of farmland, but at the same time it also provides our producer, our farm operator, um, protection to make sure that they're reimbursed for the costs of the crop in there, and then also uh, some income on top of that um, in the event it happens so they're, so they're covered as well. Uh, farm maintenance issues are in there, owner insurance is in there to make sure uh, the owners are covered as well as, as, as the operators, and then the financial management you know, the annual budgeting, um, how we receive and dis, uh, disperse funds um, through our uh, management system and our accounting system also provide um, some good protections for and some documentation for owners on their assets as well. So um, when we're looking at leases and looking at where we're going in, in 2014, uh, the three main areas that we want to emphasize is, is the value. Um, first of all, you have to know the goals that you have and identify what your return on investment wants to be and if those goals uh, meet with the type of lease you customarily have. Does your cash lease provide the opportunity to have that higher rate of return now that um, commodity prices aren't escalating um, as high as they are? Um, if not, do you need to look at a different structure? Does your cash lease provide maybe the opportunity to capitalize on increased income with the volatility in the markets? You know, two of the things we've heard lately are volatility in the commodity markets are here to stay. And the second um, point that I've heard lately is this weather situation that we've had now. Um, we're entering, I think Elwin Taylor has said that Iowa State has said repeatedly that we're entering, entering a period of 20 years of weather volatility. And if that's the case, um, we don't know that a cash lease made on, on any date uh, is going to necessarily uh, be the right lease at any time that's equitable for both the owner and the operator. And that's where that flex lease really comes into play. Or maybe it's time to look at a share lease where you extend a little more risk and have a little more um, participation on both sides to capture some of that income. The second thing is, is uh, along, along with that, establishing the value is that lease structure, um, not only how it's how it's set up as far as uh, flex cash, cash, or share, but um, if there's a certain payment schedule that fits your needs. Uh, some owners um, look at a more up upfront payment um, in the spring um, and realize that they're um, capturing some income earlier and discount that a little bit compared to um, splitting the payments in the spring and fall. Uh, and then the last, of course, that we just talked about it is, does your current lease reflect some of these lease terms that best protect your asset and best protect your farm um, and give you the greatest opportunities um, to capture some of the information that's out there? Um, as we look forward in, in the next few years, you know, I think gathering that documentation um, on your farm so you can have uh, 5, 10, 20 years of data on yields as well as um, fertility, uh, any documentation on drainage, um, that just data we all know is, is powerful information. Um, and at the same time, that data can help you make wise decisions, not only in, in the value of your lease, 
but also in infrastructure improvements on drainage. Um, years and years of data um, can help you identify where it is that tiles needed. Um, it also can uh, help uh, establish a good, fair, marketable price for your ground um, when that time comes. So those are the three things I hope we kind of covered um, with the value of the lease, the structure of the lease, and the lease terms tonight. Um, are there any questions? Brian, one of the things um, that comes up every once in a while is crop insurance. Do you, do you require the operator to carry crop insurance, or do you leave that up to them for their their own risk factors? Well, I guess I've never come across a situation where it's come up as if it's required or not required. Uh, I also don't think of any operator that we've dealt with that doesn't carry crop insurance. Uh, the last few years, crop insurance, you know, especially with the revenue products available, are one of the reasons that the cash leases have moved um, in the pattern they've had because, you know, usually by um, the, going into the spring planning season, they have a pretty good basis on, on what they can expect to guarantee themselves for the, the upcoming year. I think when we go into 2014, that's going to change a little bit um, with the lower commodity prices. We're probably not going to be guaranteeing quite as high as inco in, in income um, going in there, but, but we don't require it, but it's obviously a good risk protection for the operator, um, and at the same time, uh, when we factor in insurance, you know, in the, or factor in flex leases, you know, one of the things we look at is is that flex lease is is a pretty good opportunity to help both parties share some of that upside potential. But then our base cash uh, rent in those flex leases also um, should be a little bit reflective of what's going on with that guarantee and crop insurance too, because we know that owner or that operator, I'm sorry, has has some protection uh, revenue-wise going into the year as well. Okay. Anybody else have any questions? Brian, do you see our, our 2014 leases, are they, you see in a pattern already of reduced amounts um, by any means or not? No, I, I, you know, I think what, I think one of the things, you know, it's a case by case basis. You know, we've got some leases. Um, well, uh, we've seen or heard about some leases, you know, that that have been on the high side. But I think as we, as we look at this, the reality is, is farm leases usually um, follow um, cash, uh, or I'm sorry, farm leases usually follow um, land values, you know, a couple of years behind. Um, and right now, there's a lot of farmers that you know are, are probably able to to uh, maintain where they've been at. Uh, on that side, I don't see them going down um, a whole lot. But on the other side, I think we've probably moved from those big big increases probably back to a more stable um, lease environment. You know, if you look at the history of farm leases, um, we spent a lot of years with one dollar and two dollar increases on on leases and. You know, I'm not sure it's going to be one dollar or two dollar, but um, you know, it's going to be a little more stable than than, than some of these um, tremendously high percentage changes we've had the last two years. Okay. What's um, what kind of fees are we looking at for uh, managing a farm when you when you negotiate a lease? Well, uh, our management practices, or our management program, um, varies a little bit, but it's usually between five to eight percent. Um, with all of our leases, and we try to keep everybody fair and equitable uh, as we move through that process. Okay. Are there any other questions out there? With our September 1st deadline coming up here, uh, do you recommend that owners um, Send uh, termination notices to their to their tenants, or what's your suggestion there? Well, if you they haven't had the chance to sit down and negotiate and and get that uh, lease for 2014 done, you know that's the only means they have to keep the only means that um, definitely keeps the door open for that possibility of a change in the lease from 2013. So it would probably be a prudent thing to do if they don't have that uh, figured out yet. Okay. 
Another question here, are crop insurance uh, payments likely to be triggered this year when there's no rain? Um, I don't know, you have an answer for that or you want me to cover that? Well, you can cover it, uh, Terry. You've probably got a little more uh, closer feeling on that. I mean, based on we had, like for corn, we had a $5.65 uh, spring price, so uh, that set the guarantee. The price, uh, the from the looks of it, uh, the fall price is probably going to be less than the spring price, so the spring guarantee is going to hold true. Now we're just going to have to wait to see once what that fall price is times the actual production out there to determine what the value of that crop will be. And once we know that number, then we'll compare that to the, uh, the guarantee. And if it's less, the, the value of the harvested crop is less, and of course there's going to be a an indemnity payment made to those producers. So it all amounts to uh, still, yeah, we have to go through the month of October to determine the price of both corn and, and beans um, for the fall fall trigger price, and then we'll we'll figure that out from there. So, and I think Terry, along that line, it, it's this year we're probably looking at more of the. You know, there's going to be some areas where the crop will be short, and obviously some of the areas that had a lot of rain in the spring and, um, and wet. But you know, our our price. If you just take a look at the price from where it was at in that guarantee to where it is today, you know, that's nearly a 20 percent decline in price, and and right. some of those options for crop insurance, we're already getting close to triggering a payment, even with right. fairly normal yields. Well, and that's that's the key with with a dollar less on uh, projected prices here from the spring. You know, you could almost have an average yield your APH yield and still get an indemnity payment because the level is down. So, but anyway, are there any other questions out there? Don't want to hold everybody up. I'm not seeing any more questions uh, typed in here. So, uh, again, thank you everybody for for uh, participating today, and hopefully it was informative. Uh, if you have any questions on farm lease or conservation activities, uh, make sure you get a hold of Brian or Daryl, uh, and uh, they will most certainly be able to uh, help answer the questions and possibly give you the, the information you need to make more informed decisions. So seeing no other questions out there, thanks again, everybody, and uh, we look forward to, to seeing you next, next week at the same time. We'll talk a little bit about land values. Have a good evening, everyone.